Okay, so thank you all for showing up to this presentation. Uh, I am really excited uh, because I know that uh, Rebecca has helped me personally in the past. Uh, she's a friend uh, that I met a few years ago and uh, with her SEO advice. So, um, you know, we appreciate that you've taken time out of your days to join us and hopefully that you also will learn something. So Rebecca Gill is the founder of Web Savvy Marketing and they're a boutique WordPress centric design and marketing agency. She runs SEO Bootcamp as well, which is a multi-day workshop dedicated to teaching people of all levels the ins and, out, ins and outs of search engine optimization and how it can run their business. But if that's not enough, she also has her own SEO courses at DIYSEOcourses.com. So like I said, I've personally known Rebecca for a few years now, and I have to say I've always been uh, incredibly impressed with how she keeps her finger on the pulse um, in search engine optimization, which... Um, as many of you probably know, is an ever-changing um, landscape. So, and, you know, one of the things I appreciate the most, though, about Rebecca is that she's not about, you know, sleazy tricks or, or gaming the system techniques for SEO, but just really tried and true, um, solid advice that has an impact and that you can implement uh, worry-free without having to worry about getting Google slapped or sandboxed or anything like that. So. It's a uh, it's a real treat, and I, you know, Rebecca and I were talking before uh, before we started it up, and it's funny. One of the first times I came across her site, I actually Googled. I pulled open Google and, and just typed in uh, WordPress web design, and uh, as you can imagine, it's probably it's a pretty competitive term, and that is uh, number one. At least it appeared for num number one for me at the time, and I just checked it again, and it still was. Uh, so she practices what she preaches, and. Uh, <laughs> We're about to get a little bit of insight in that today. Uh, another one that's um, pretty great as well, it's uh, not only WordPress web design, but if you Google SEO consulting, SEO consulting, Rebecca is on the first page of Google for that, and she is above Yoast, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so with that said, I want to pass it on to Rebecca for, uh, for her presentation. Rebecca, uh, it's all yours. Can't wait to, uh, to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Justin. Um, welcome, everybody, and welcome to you people across the world who are up at uh, 3 a.m. In, in the morning your time. I cannot believe you are. You're crazy, and I love it, and I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to go through today a presentation for about 45 minutes, <clears throat> and then I'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions, just keep pumping them through the little chat box for Justin, and he'll collect all of those, and then he'll present those, uh, throw those out to me at the end. Um, just one word, I have been sick these the last couple of weeks and I am still coughing today and I apologize in advance if I cough during the presentation. I've got my little cough drop so I'm hoping that's not going to be the case. But I didn't want to cancel because Justin had so many people registered and I know that you guys are eager to come on and I want to really provide value to you. So just, you know, my apologies in advance for um, any annoyance that I cause. So with that said, let's jump in. Um, just a little bit of background on me. <coughs> I have been doing SEO for 15 years. Uh, I, I taught myself SEO back when I was a VP of marketing at a software company out of um, Ohio. And I competed with companies like Microsoft and SAP and Oracle, which had really large organizations behind them and, and marketing teams and, you know, and pools of SEO people that could really work and do a lot of good things. And uh, it was that scrappiness and the, the need to feed my children that really taught me the ins and outs. So, what I'm going to discuss today uh, with you isn't something that I just read somewhere else. It's not something that I just picked up on a blog post. It's actually something that's a process that I have put into place over the last 15 years. I used this process when I competed against the large guys, you know, 15 years ago. I've used it 10 years ago. I've used it five years ago, and I use it with my business today. Um, and I do know LearnDash really well. I have my own courses on LearnDash at DIYSEOcourses.com. Uh, so I do kind of know what you guys are struggling with, and uh, my goal today is to help teach you uh, my process and how you can weave that into your online courses to help increase your sales. So with that said, let's uh, jump right in. <coughs> so first and foremost with SEO, and my philosophy and my view of SEO and what's made me successful is I've always used a very structured plan that I've executed off of. So I didn't jump from one thing to another a blog post I read here, a blog post I read there, or some tip that somebody said in a webinar. I really have a structured plan and I want to take you through that plan because I think it's really 
important for you to get yourself in a solid structure process because it's that process that sets you apart from everybody else and it's that process that helps you execute and do great things in the long term. So this is my plan. It's broken out into, into a, <coughs> excuse me, three sections. The first one's research, then planning, and then execution. So I start with asking a lot of questions about my target market and about me and what, what I potentially offer to that target market. I next move into um, reviewing history and any data I have, and we'll talk about places that you can get that data. I look at my competitors and I look to see what they're doing, what they're targeting, what may be working for them and what may not be working for them. <laughs> then I build a seed list of preferred keywords. And so, so a seed list is um, phrases that I think that I might be able to rank for or I want to rank for. And I just, this is like a large list that I just assemble over time. And it's just, a, it's a thought, you know, just like it's brainstorming is basically what you're doing. Then I start to pull volume, search volume, so I can see what, how many people search for those various phrases. Then I go in and I score those for relevance. How closely do those, those volumes really translate to what, I, what I'm doing and what I'm selling and who I'm trying to reach? Then once I have a narrowed down list of keywords, I'm going to assign those to individual pieces of content in my website or my courses or you know, wherever my blog, wherever that may be. Uh, but there is going to be a plan you know, one to two, <coughs> one keyword to one piece of content or two keyword phrases to a piece of content, but there will be basically a roadmap. Then once I have that roadmap, I start to write quality content. This could be sales pages, this could be blog posts, or it could be your main course page. Then I optimize that content for both SEO and usability, and I launch it, and then I start to promote it offline with link building and social media, and then I wait and I see what happens. And I find out what's ranking and what was successful, and I try to reverse engineer that process to say, holy crap, that worked. Now, how did that happen? What did I do differently with that versus something else? And this process that I have just showed you, this is what I've done for 15 years. This is how I taught myself SEO back then when we didn't have a lot of resources available, and it works. Justin gave you examples of phrases that I've ranked on, and I've targeted, and there's a lot of other ones, um, but, but this is the process. And, uh, I always talk about SEO is more than a plugin with WordPress, and I don't like when people chase the green dot. And I, I say that not because I don't like Yoast. I think Yoast is a wonderful team. I think that they're highly intelligent, and they have a great plugin. It's a wonderful tool, but it's only part of this overall process. And a lot of people jump into that tool, and they forget that there's all this other work that needs to take place to be successful. And that's what I want to take you through today. I want you to understand the process and how you can weave this process into your online courses. Okay, first I said I have to ask a lot of questions, and you need to ask a lot of questions. So what questions should you ask? Here's a list of the common ones that I have. When I start with, <coughs> like our SEO boot camp that we do, the on-site workshop, this is homework that people have to answer before they even arrive at boot camp, because this is your starting place. Who are you? What do you do? What makes you different from somebody else? It could be your skill set. It could be the information that you deliver in a course. But what makes you different? Now, who do you compete with? You want to know who you compete with so you can beat them. You need to be able to research them and find out what they're doing and, and who they're targeting so you can do better. <coughs> who do you help? Who is your target market? And how do you help them? Not specifically you solve their problems, but what kind of problems do they have that you can provide answers to? And then you have to start looking at your content and whether that be your course, your sales page, your supporting product pages, your blog posts. Are you answering any of those questions? And a lot of times once you go through these questions and you start answering them and you start looking back and you're like, wow, I really don't answer any of these questions with my website. And then you kind of give, you have that revelation of I've missed the boat from an SEO standpoint, but you know that you've got a lot of places that think, and things that you can work on to increase your current position, and that's a beautiful place to be in. <coughs> okay, so next I said I do a lot of research, and I do. These are the tools I love. This guy right here is SEMrush. You can do a free trial of SEMrush, and then if you love it, like I do, you can subscribe to it. It's not cheap, but I use this tool every single day. Now, if you're going to, after this webinar, dig into SEO, sign up for the free trial. It'll be worth it. You can see every 
your competitors' keywords, what they're ranking for, and the actual URLs that they're ranking. And then it helps you kind of figure out why they're ranking. SpyFu is very similar. I used to love this one. Still like it a lot, but I love SEMrush better because it gives me better data and the way that I like to view it. Uh, Moz has a great toolbar as well as some other resources that you can use for free or purchase. <coughs> this is my other next guy that I have to have and I use all the time. It's KW Finder. It is for purchase, but it is relatively cheap and it helps you find keywords to rank for. <coughs> Excuse me. But it also allows you to look at those keywords and who's ranking and figure out why they're ranking. DinoMapper is really good for understanding the context of your own website or your competitors. It will crawl any URL and give you a complete output of the data, both um, the URLs as well as the page titles, how much text is on each page, the hierarchy of those pages or posts or courses, and it really helps you get a better understanding of your content as well as that of your competitor. And then these are two other tools that I use occasionally. They're not as much as I love my SEM Rush, but also um, some good some good resources. Um, and if you're taking notes right now, you don't really have to. My slides are available on SlideShare, so you're welcome to go and jump over there and download them at any time. Okay, so I talked about building a seed list. After you've answered your questions and you know who your competitors are, you know um, who you're targeting, what their problems are. Hopefully, as you've done that, you started to see some keywords emerge that you could put into your brainstorming list or your seed list. I'd also like you to go through another uh, exercises, and these are the steps that I go through. One is simply brainstorm. Write down whatever comes to your head. I actually have something in notes that shares across my desktop, <coughs> my iPad, my phone, and as keywords come to my mind on any given day, I throw them in there to research them later. Then I do manual variations of any words that I've thought of or phrases. Um, and so the one thing I say is don't rely on Google for this because you know why you can get <coughs> data from Google, they're only gonna give you so many. People search for a lot of things and so you really need to start thinking about variations. And a variation would be LMS versus learning management system versus WordPress templates versus WordPress themes. You know, there's similar topics, but there's different ways to use those phrases. And so document those and make yourself a list. <coughs> also look at any reports you may have, presentations, course outlines, emails that you receive from people asking about your course. What words are they using? Put these into your seed list. Google Search Console, the search analytics section of it, has a huge amount of data. That's where your website shows in search where people may never actually get to the website itself because you're ranking on page 10. It's a great starting point, as is your Google Analytics reports. But this guy, the search analytics, must have for creating a seed list. If you don't have a Search Console account, go sign up for one today. Get yourself installed in it with the website. Start collecting data. AdWords is a great tool if you're running pay-per-click because it will give you ideas, although I do not rely on it because I personally view pay-per-click as cooking for marketers and I never do it. So for me, that's no longer a viable solution for data, which is why I use KW Finder instead. <coughs> Google Auto Suggest and Related Searches, wonderful tool for finding other suggestions. Bing Webmaster Tools is another one. How many out there you actually have a Webmaster Tools account? I'd love to get feedback on that. Competitor content and sitemaps. They have HTML sitemaps, they have XML sitemaps. You can usually get to both. What do they have on their pages? What do they talk about in their core pages? Visually look at them and document what they have. You'll be surprised at how many keywords erupt and jump off the screen at you once you start looking. <laughs> Competitors, meta titles, and descriptions. You can get that through the Moz toolbar. Uh, easily see any of that data through source code as well, but it's not nearly as fun. Here I come back to my tools, SpyFu and SEMrush. Wonderful for deep diving your competition. Use them and use them often. And then KW Finder. I love KW Finder. Use it every day. Um, can't suggest this tool more than I am now. <coughs> so what do you do once you have a, a seed list and you, you know, you've thought about some phrases? 
So if I'm going to um, write a course, or even write a blog post to support my course, what would I do? Well, I'd start um, documenting what I'm going to cover. If it's a course, it could be your outline for the blog post, it could be major points you want to cover. Then you're going to write down some search phrases that you think might pertain to it. Okay, Any, anything that you think that could be potentially related to this topic. <coughs> It'll help you kind of frame up that idea in your head and figure out you know, what search might be associated with the words that you're going to put down in that page or the video that you're creating. Next, search, for, search Google to see who shows up on page one and actually look at the results. How closely are the results tied to the phrase that you search for? Look at the content. Can you beat that content? You know, can you create something better? <coughs> I document all of these results to help guide me along the process so I don't forget something. Then I use cool tools like um, the Keyword Planner or KW Finder to look at the volumes. And then I start to get narrowing down, you know, what could be a potential um, solution for me. And when we look at volumes, try to do something you contain. Don't go after 60,000, especially if you're new to SEO. It's just not going to happen. You're better off having a lot of lower volume results than one massive search term that takes you six months to rank. <coughs> the last thing is when you find a phrase, you need to ask yourself if you can use it in writing, right? Because you'll get suggestions that you can't form into a sentence or a course title, and then it just makes it really hard for you to work with it. So just get rid of those. <coughs> okay. So let's look at our keyword selection and let's throw up some warning. Before you proceed, I want you to look at the keywords to see if they're precise enough or are they too generic. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing so much. So let's look at the first one, guitar lessons. 73,000 searches. That looks great, doesn't it? You might say yes. And the difficulty means how hard would it be to rank? 55, that's kind of difficult. Problem is it's too broad. You don't know if that's in-person guitar lessons, if it's a course, if it's a lesson, it's a teacher, you know, it's a book, it's, 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 it's too broad, so you whack that. How about learn to play guitar? 18,000, better, easier to rank on, problem is it's bad English, it's going to be hard to write about. How about guitar courses? Lower volume, easier to rank on, specific to the course you're going to write, way better. How about online guitar course? Even more narrow, because this is an online course. Volume's better, a little harder to rank, but still pretty good. Now what about learn how to play guitar by yourself? <coughs> Longer, still good search volume, easier to rank on, very specific to who you're targeting and the problems that they have. This is a good search volume. <coughs> One caution though, is you need to ask yourself, have you used it before, have you targeted it? Because you don't want your courses and your products and your posts and your categories to compete with each other. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Okay, so next, let's digest this page because now I'm starting to take those keywords and map it to actual content in the website. Glance through those keywords for a second and the locations and just look at them one by one because I'm trying to get you into thought process that I want you to retain and to use moving forward. If I were to target all of these phrases, what I'm trying to do is say, Okay, all these phrases look good, but where would I put them? You know, where would they locate in the website? This is plural, online guitar courses. If my website is about online guitar courses, this might be great for the main course page or the main store page. Guitar course for beginners. It's more specific. It's about a specific course. Okay, so that's an entry-level course. What about acoustic or electric? If I'm going to have courses just for them, they would be their own course. But again, each course would have its own specific keyword focus. Guitar instructor, that's not a course, that's a, that's a noun. So that would be like your about page or a page talking about the instructor yourself itself and the capabilities and things like that. And then we get to that one long phrase. It's a great blog post, which will not only bring search in, but also feed people over with both links and traffic to your other pieces of content. Super important for a holistic, um, SEO campaign. So uh, one pro tip, and I catch myself doing this with courses, is I forget to make sure that my course page and my product page, because you know, like I use WooCommerce that connects to LearnDash, you need to make sure that they're not targeting the same phrase, because if they do, now you're positioning them Google, 
to compete against each other. And you don't want to compete against yourself. That degrades your overall site and the, the traffic and the ranking you're going to have for those, the course in the page, the product page. So don't do that. Have different phrases that you're going to focus on for both individual pieces of content. Hey, Another word, Rebecca. Oh, I'll just. Yes. I just want to. I'll let you get a drink of water, and okay. uh, I just want to. I want to reiterate that one because there's probably a lot of people on here that are using Learn Dash, and they're using um, a shopping cart, WooCommerce, Easy Digital Downloads, for example, <laughs> to sell your sell their courses. And so, just to point out, Rebecca's point here is is a great one. Um, don't com you know, don't put your sales message on the course page and hope to rank that and then put that same information on the product page because you're going to compete with yourself uh, in that instance. So just have a little bit of awareness as the, uh, about the text that you're putting on for both of those, uh, of the sales text or the, or the words that you're target, targeting. Um, the only other point, um, as Rebecca was going through, she was talking about these different keywords and um, I can recall uh, back in 2012 and Learn Dash started. Uh, it was started as a blog, and I remember at the time looking up WordPress LMS, and <laughs> it was something really low, like a hundred or something like that searches a month. That um, just in targeting that keyword on our end um, reaped uh, huge benefits, especially as you know the industry started to get bigger, and because now you know we're, we rank really highly for that. So. Uh, the point is, if you see something that's maybe ranked low, uh, it, it still is probably going to be worth your time to pursue it because, uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen in, in the industry of your courses or just if more people are going to start searching that over time, uh, by being the first one in there, uh, you're going to, you're really going to benefit. So uh, that's just my two cents. I apologize for interrupting, but I thought maybe it'd give you a chance to, to catch your breath a little bit. Oh, no, it's great, and I love the insight because it helps the, the audience, so interrupt at any time. Uh, two more things. As he was talking, I thought about, you know, one is <coughs> as you pick your products versus your course, people will be more inclined to link into the product sales page, um, so that's going to carry weight with SEO, so keep that in mind. Uh, and then the other one is the last point that I have down here is <coughs> when you're assigning keywords, don't assign keywords to things that's hidden between behind logins and subscriptions because if you can't get to it, neither can the search engines, therefore you're not going to rank it. So, you know, keep that in mind. You know, you're not going to rank a lesson or a topic that has a keyword focus if it's blocked by login. Okay, next, write content that users and search engines will both love. And by this I'm talking about things that you're trying to position for keyword ranking, not your actual courses themselves. So long, for con long form content wins on the internet, and that's really anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 words per page. And you might think it's hard to do that with a sales page, but you gotta be creative because that's really what's gonna rank. And here's some statistics. <coughs> for the number 10 spot, the average number of words was 2,000. Number one was 2416. So it, it's going to vary by competition, but you need to really look at this and say, okay, you know, what do I need to rank? The best place to figure that out is look at the competition who's already on page one. <coughs> How much do they have in their content? Because if they're all 2,000, you're not going to rank with 500. Um, other things to consider is longer content is more loved in social media, which will drive more shares and more link building, you know, efforts that you don't even have to do because other people are linking because it's really good content. And then, uh, what, you know, conversions are going to be influenced by that content. You know, the more that you can get people to buy in, the more they're going to be likely to convert. <coughs> okay, optimize for SEO best practices. I use this across everything, even if it's, you know, a blog post or a product or, you know, whatever it is. But this also absolutely applies to product pages and course pages. <coughs> Real quick, um, there's been a few questions, so okay. let's add some, add some clarity around the course page and product page. So when you say course pages and when you say product pages, can you just add some clarity about what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. I'll actually show you an example. It'll probably be easier. Perfect. I'll take you to my Learn, Learn Dash course. Okay, so this is my Learn Dash course, uh, my main course. I have, I'll right click that. <laughs> this is the course page. So this is my main course where you can see all of the lessons and the topics. 
Okay, so this is a course page. This is where someone comes in to get their content, but I want to show people this content because I have such a massive course, right? I want to give them access to this to see at a high level. <coughs> then I have the product page. This is where people actually come in and buy. Okay, you know, reviews, things like that. So this is where they would come in to make that purchase. I have a lot of information in this page as well. Kind of a summary. So that's what I'm talking about, the product versus the course page. You know, the course, the actual content versus the buy, the buy button. Does that help? Yes, I think uh, I think that's perfect. Um, hopefully you guys could see that. Um, so Rachel saying, wow, I need to make more pages on my site. That's, a, that's fine. I'm glad you guys are, are finding these useful. I, I, like I said, Rebecca has a ton of good insights here. But uh, again, and, thanks. For and don't feel bad because guess what? I'm slacking too. You know, I, I want to have like lots of blog posts and stuff. The last time I did a blog post was in November. You know, I, I, I don't drink all of my own Kool-Aid and it's just because I also have time restraints just like everybody else. Yeah, absolutely, I, absolutely. Totally understandable. Um, Okay, so sorry to, to interrupt the flow, but uh, I think nope, that was super good. useful. All right, go okay, ahead. So when we look at on-site SEO or on-page SEO, here's things you need to consider. <coughs> it's the name of the content itself. You know, what, what's the title you're giving to your course, your product, your post? That in WordPress usually defaults the URL and the H1 header. And then we also have the subheaders. Uh, paragraph text, keyword variations, links internal to the site, uh, link anchor text, images, readability as a whole, <coughs> and then the meta titles and descriptions. Don't panic, we're going to go after these one by one. Okay, the name, just what you give to the content, you know, whatever verbiage for mine was like the to the top SEO course. <coughs> and you need to include the keyword phrase that you focused on. Don't repeat it, just have it in there. Um, and then the, ideally, it's just to the start of the page title and not towards the end if you're, especially like blog posts. It doesn't always work, but if you can, you know, that's something that you want to definitely do. <coughs> the URL should have your keyword as well. Try to weave that in. Don't have funky characters that are, you know, like the question marks and all that kind of things. Use dashes to separate the words. Content silos are great. <coughs> um, that's a whole other webinar. I do have some in my YouTube channel. Uh, that you can find that I talk about content silos. Uh, H1 headers, automatically created by WordPress. Don't add any additional ones in that because they set up hierarchy for the page. This should include your keyword phrase. It's giving Google the overall writing topic of the page or post or whatever it is. I'm going to say page, but I mean course, whatever. It's giving Google an idea of what comes after that. And the H1, I like only one. Um, and then you can have multiple twos and threes because <coughs> they create the outline, right? Um, they're going to create the structure for that, that content, to, it's just like a story outline. That's what those H2s to H6s do for the search engines. They, they segment that content out. If you can have a keyword in one of those, great. You don't have to, but it definitely helps Google get a better understanding of what that piece of content's about. And again, I'm not going to go through all of this because we only have so much time. Grab the slides and SlideShare, download them so that you have kind of a guide to walk through. <coughs> your paragraph text is important. You want to make sure that your keyword is represented in the paragraph text, preferably in the first sentence or two if you can. Variations are important, more important than keyword density. This doesn't really matter anymore to the search engines. Variations are much more important. <coughs> Don't stuff. You don't need 500 keywords of the same thing in one piece of content that's not natural. You know, you're writing for the user, and your goal is to make sure that what you're writing helps everyone figure out what this content's about. <coughs> what I always see people do, they pick a keyword, they give it to the page net title, and then they never actually include it in the content. Well, that's an issue because if the search engines don't see it again in the content, it doesn't make sense to them what the content's about. Your whole goal here is to be repetitive with that keyword phrase so that the search engines can understand that what my web design page is about web design and not about phishing. You know, that's the goal. And you're, you're just trying to kind of give subtle indicators on keeping that all collectively together. Okay, those care, keyword variations has its own slide because it's so important. How do you figure out those keyword uh, uh, variations? 
Look at Google. Look for the related searches at the bottom or your competitor websites or KW Finder. They'll give you tons of them. They're great tools for getting variations and really understanding, you know, how you can naturally weave those in. If you're writing for the user, it's automatically going to happen and know that that's great. If I say website uh, or WordPress theme, it's natural for me to also use WordPress template in the same piece of content because they're interchangeable. And that's important. SEO versus search engine optimization. Google loves that because it's written for the real, the real human visitor. Images are important. <coughs> Images will help both people digest the content. They'll also be more shareable on social. Um, the images that you select, it's great to have the keyword in the image file name as well as the alt text, but don't force it. Don't show a person uh, image of people and use a keyword of LMS because that makes no sense, right? You have to only use the keywords in there if it's going to make sense. And when you're creating that alt text, describe the image. This is directly from Google. If you're showing an image of a puppy, having this with this alt text of blank, bad, search engines don't know what that image is about, putting puppy in the next line, better, putting Dalmatian puppy playing fetch, which is what the image is really about, wonderful. Google loves that. Puppy dog, baby dog, pup, pup, puppies, that's bad. That's spam. You're going to get marked down by the search engines and your piece of content will get degraded. <coughs> Internal links. I'd like you to read this little guy right here because this is straight from the, oops, sorry, straight from the search engines. An internal link pointing to a page is a signal to search engines about the importance of that page. If an important page does, or excuse me, an important page does not appear in the list, and they're talking about the list within Google Search Console of your most linked pages, it's considered less important to the search engines. So the more you link to a page or a piece of content inside your site, the more the search engines believe that's important, right? Same thing for external links coming in. When Google sees external links, you know, from other websites or blogs linking into a piece of your content, it tells it that someone other than your mom cares about what you write. And, it, you know, someone other than your dog is looking at your blog post. These are super important factors to the search engines because it needs to know that you're relevant to the world around you. So links are really important. And here's some guidelines I want you to go through when you're creating those links internally. <coughs> Okay, um, link anchor text. Please, oh please, don't put read more or click here because that doesn't tell the visitor what they're going to link to and it doesn't tell the search engines what they're linking to and it's crappy for SEO. You need the links going to, so for example, Justin said my website design page has ranked really well for him. One of the reasons is throughout my site, I'm linking into that with website design, WordPress web design, WordPress website design, and I'm consistently using a certain set of phrases for internal links into that page. And I link to it often. Tells the search engines that page is important and the words I'm using to link into it helps the search engines understand what that page is about. <coughs> Readability. I used to have an example that I would show, and if I could think of what it was, I would I would pull it up right now because um, bling is bad. Bling, bright neon, all different size fonts. You don't need to have a highly professional $80,000 website, but your website better have good usability. It needs to have short paragraphs that are easier to read, bullets for lists, subheaders so people can scan content and figure out the chunks and read the chunk that's most important to them. It needs to have verbiage that regular people use and not a bunch of industry jargon that only, you know, PhD level person understands. The images should be placed so that they don't interfere with the text flow and it make it difficult to read. You know, get rid of the dancing pizzas and, and the flashy neon in your site and the logo that's as big as my head. We don't want that on the website. We want it to be really digestible and pleasant for people to come in and read and digest and it's really important. Usability is a really high factor for SEO now and, if, and that's because if it's a visitors are happy, that makes Google happy and that equals to higher ranking. If your website is a disaster and it's ugly and it's difficult to read and you've got 10 different size fonts and bolds where you shouldn't have bolds and all these different colors and it's hard to digest the content, people are going to leave. That's not going to make the search engines happy and they're going to degrade you in rank and search. So remember the usability is extremely important. 
meta titles and descriptions are important and I know people will say they don't matter but they do because it's the first opportunity to have to sell somebody in search they see that before they ever see your website <coughs> the meta title meta description is something that you put in that Yoast tool for your content that shows up in the search results box it should be the meta title should be a title not a sentence it should be easy to read it should include your focus keyword and it should tell the visitor what they're going to find and, and, and be enticing and it should be under 55 characters <coughs> the description should be a sentence just one or two sentences it should describe again what people are going to find make it enticing don't make it cheesy salesy but make it enticing put the keyword phrase in there have it close to the beginning as possible keep it 150 characters or less so it's actually going to be viewed um, but you, again, your first opportunity to sell people, so you need to really, really make sure that it's going to describe the content and help people find what they're going to, you know, have as a result on that page. So common mistakes people have. Well, you throw your course up, you spent <coughs> 80 hours writing the course, you get to your sales page, and you've got nothing there. Or you copied it from somebody else, or it's full of errors. That's crappy content you know don't fill the white space with just text make sure it's really going to resonate to the the visitor go back to those questions I asked you at the beginning who do you serve what are their problems you know what do they struggle with and what solution do you have to give them right that's what you want to have on your sales page that's what you want to have within your website your blog post should answer specific questions for that um, you know, that's, there's so many opportunities you have to help to people, but you need to make sure that your content is going to be really good content. And remember that it needs to not be just 300 words. It needs to be 1,000 words. It needs to be up to 2,000 words to really resonate and stand out on today's Internet. The other mistake, forgetting the keyword. It's all the time that I see that. People are like, no, I got a great blog post. My sales page is awesome. I look at it, and I'm like, what's your focus keyword? I'm like, you don't even have it on here anywhere. They're like, oh, crap. And it happens all the time. So after you write whatever piece of content you're trying to optimize, set it aside, come back, do a scan, a, you know, a find for the phrase and see how many times it pops up. And, you know, if it's not popping up, then just edit it, tweak it. You've already probably given a phrase that's close to it. Just weave in your keywords some, in, in a, certain, you know, a few places. Again, it doesn't have to be all over. Variations are good as opposed to density, but just make sure it's there so the search engines can understand what that phrase is relating to that piece of content. Uh, the next one is inaccurate SEO knowledge. <coughs> Whenever anyone comes to me and says, you know, I need your help, I need some link building, I really need to get some link juice, that scares me because that link juice comment tells me they're most likely reading a blog post that's really old. When they say keyword density, I know that they're reading older, you know, information. <coughs> Learning SEO is wonderful. Anybody can do their own SEO. Anybody can excel at it. I'm good proof of that. Um, but you've got to write, find the right information. You need to make sure that you're reading current day information from somebody you can trust. Be very careful about reading anything that's five years old or ten years old or even three years old because guess what? It's out of date. It can get you in trouble. The things we did ten years ago, five years ago, two years ago, a lot of times we can't do that now. So make sure you stay up to date with the most relevant information that you can. All right. <laughs> I made it through, uh, ready for questions that people have. I certainly hope that we have some. And Jason, or excuse me, Justin's uh, joking about the dancing pizza. My neighbor, Jason, has a company that makes pizza ovens and equipment. And on his website, he had a dancing pizza. That's why I say that. I was sitting at dinner one time with him and his wife, and his wife men mentioned it. And I kid you not, beer came flying out my mouth laughing. And I said, I don't believe it. And she whipped out her phone and she showed me that there was a dancing pizza on his website. And that was probably just three years ago. So say no to the dancing pizza. All right, Justin, I'm going to throw it over to you to see what questions we have. Absolutely. Well, first, I want to personally thank you, Rebecca. Um, the comments were, were flowing in during your conversation and um, people were really loving the content. And as you, probably all of you could tell, uh, there was a lot here. Um, Rebecca knows this industry in and out, and so she has a lot to share. Uh, as a reminder, the, her slides are available, so all those little pro tips that were on each slide, you can um, you can get those. I, I put the the link to the presentation in 
in the uh, in the chat there. Uh, also, the presentation is being recorded, so I know a few of you have asked that, and I'll just reiterate that it is. Um, and again, Rebecca, thank you so much for for joining us with a cold on top of it. Um, <laughs> really, my appreciate pleasure. It. And so with that said, I have a few um, questions here that people have been submitting throughout. Um, feel free, anybody, if you think of a question, to ask it um, now. I can't guarantee that we'll get to it. I, I will try my best to, to grab the ones that I feel are most applicable to, to everybody here. Um, so if it's pretty specific to your use case, it, it might not get asked. But let's start things off. Um, and I just copied in, in these questions, so I don't necessarily have the name of the people that have asked it. But let's start off with this one. Somebody has a site where they're selling courses, and they want to know um, how often they have to update the content and the keywords. So be it on the course description page or the product page or the <laughs> website in general, how often does that content need to be updated as well as their keywords? So it's going to depend on your industry. Um, Google likes fresh content as a whole, right? So the website itself needs to have fresh content coming into it and updates. I will tell you like my website design page and my SEO consulting page, which are main service pages for me on the Web Savvy site, and they've been there for eight years, I make sure I update those like every three to six months. I don't necessarily change the keyword focus, but I make sure that there's fresh content on them. And you know, I try to make sure that I have a blog post coming on the Web Savvy site like um, every week, although I don't usually be able to meet that, you know, just because of my schedule, but I definitely have goals. The best thing to do is look around at your, your competition and see how often they're updating content. How many new blog posts or new courses are they adding? because that will help you give a benchmark to what you might have to do yourself. Perfect. And sticking with that content theme, Rebecca, <laughs> um, does it matter how soon in the page or on the page the content, um, in, in, in the content, the keyword appears? Like I know I've heard in the past uh, that it, it's nice to have that keyword in the title and then maybe in that first paragraph. Does, does that still matter? It does, yeah. And, and the the... Is it absolute? No, but it's, it definitely helps because what you're just doing for the search engines is you're reinforcing that's what that content's about, right? The whole point of the, the Yoast SEO tool is to help make sure you're hitting all those things I just talked about, right? Just reinforcing those, those triggers to the search engines. Just say, this is what this content's about. It's about this keyword. That's what that tool's doing for you. Um, so yeah, so it does matter. It's not absolutely critical, but it will be helpful. Very good. That's good to know. So, with a you know, somebody asked actually is very convenient. <laughs> uh, they want to know, um, you know, for plugins such as Yoast that have um, indicators about keyword density and all that. So, is that is that still relevant? I know you mentioned that maybe it's less so than it used to be, but um, should people still be looking at, at those indicators of you know how many times their keyword is used within the content? I don't uh, pay much attention to density. I make sure that I use it. A couple of times, I don't, I don't live and breathe by density, and Yoast has downgraded that in the past updates. It used to be a higher density factor, and he's actually reduced it down. You know, it's there because people use it, and <coughs> excuse me, and you need to remember, they have to balance the changes they make to that plugin with the user pool, and you know, there's only so many modifications you can make without the user community freaking out, right, and getting really upset. He has to do minor changes over time that people can digest. And he also just can't constantly change things all the time based on, you know, as soon as the search engines do something. So um, it is there. I would tell you to use it, but I would tell you not to go. That's not your, your main concern. <coughs> okay, perfect. And thank you all for submitting questions. I'm going through <laughs> them now and trying to pick the ones that are, you know, kind of go with the flow of our conversation. But, um, you know, here's a good one. This is kind of it's talking about content a little bit, but essentially for marketing a course, and I'll just read it here. Uh, it's from Ron. He asks, how do I optimize for a broad tap topic rather than a silo? For example, knowledge for high-level engineers versus knowledge for automobile electrical engineers. That's a pretty big question. <laughs> so, you know, um, so here's an example. Broad topic. Google knows I talk about WordPress and website design <coughs> and SEO on my Web Savvy site, right? Those are my broad topics. So as a rule, if I, if I talk about or I blog about or I post content on, you know, smaller uh, segments within that, I have an easier time ranking because that's my topic as a whole. 
but if you still want to wear any kind of phrase, you have to have some piece of content for that phrase in the website. And then you have different content for the more minor versions of that, like automotive. <coughs> I think I can give um, I can give somewhat of an answer to that too. Is a lot of times you know <coughs> we'll blog a lot and um, you know blog a lot about the e-learning industry, for example. And you know we, in the beginning of Learn Dash, we were targeting like WordPress LMS and learning management, WordPress learning management system, and things like that. Uh, and you know as I just was doing that those blog those blog posts and writing about you know stuff in the industry found come to find out that we started ranking for um, you know a little bit for terms that were higher up so um, online course software I think was one that learn dash ranks fairly high for and don't quote me on that but it's something along those lines and it, we never targeted that keyword but we we're just going you know writing about the industry and then also targeting <laughs> maybe easier um, easier keywords for us and uh, and then suddenly we started getting these these more competitive ones. So uh, you know sometimes it's kind of like a trickle up effect. Um, but you know in that case, um, looking at some more questions here. So many coming in. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, do you need a different target keyword for every blog post, or can they be reused? No, don't reuse them because you compete with yourself. Why compete with yourself? Because what you're doing is, if I blogged three times on the same exact phrase, and that was my focus, I'm asking Google to pick the best one. Why would I do that? Why would I make Google figure out which piece of content to pick? That's my job as the marketer. That's my job with my roadmap, is to make sure that I present the best piece of content for a given phrase so that there's no question. It's a keep it simple, stupid process, or you know, philosophy. Make it easy on the search engines. The easier you make it on them to be able to find your content, the more they're going to rank you because it's easy. They don't need to have, you know, all this decision-making process. So you need to create that clear path. And you can easily create that clear path because there's so many variations you can have for a phrase. You don't need three blog posts targeting the same phrase. You have three different phrases and they can interlink to each other and help each other all rank. That's great advice, and then the same can be said for pages on your website. So yes, you know, just regular pages, not just the blog posts. <coughs> I'm going through the questions here, guys. Thanks so much. If you have a question, please do send it um, <coughs> in the chat. I will try to get to it, um, but I want to respect everyone's time as well. All right, so bringing it back to courses, back to Learn Dash. Uh, is it okay to title your course one way in Learn Dash, uh, and then another but similar way in your meta title? Um, so, well, Learn Dash, it, it, what is showing for on the page? It's, you know, the H1, the URL, the meta title, meta description. You all want those to be in sync because those are all indicators to help Google figure out what that content's about. Can you have variations? Yes, but it will make it more difficult for the search engines to fully understand the focus of that content. That's a great point. Yep. <coughs> So thanks, Rebecca, for a great presentation. Uh, that's coming in as well. So lots of great compliments. Thanks, guys, for sending that. that. That means a lot. And we're happy that Rebecca came out, and even though she was under the weather. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see as we go through. As I'm looking for another uh, question, something that I found of value in in that presentation immediately, and something I have I I guess I see all the time is people will have course pages in Learn Dash, and of course they're going to have images and and in their description, and a lot of times not just text. Very, very, very rarely do they um, use the the tips that you shared, Rebecca, about how to um, you know add descriptions and alt text and whatnot to the images to help you know to help with their SEO. Um, I think that that's a tip that everybody here today, if you have a course or you created one, you could do right now. And I guarantee that if you have somebody else that's creating a course uh, in your space that they, they may be overlooking that opportunity. So Especially that, uh, if your course teaches something visual. You know, I mean, like when we launched the theme store that I had years ago, we would rank all the time in Google Images because I optimized those images for the templates, and that did bring in search, and that did bring in sales. So, you know, they, they can really tr translate into very good volume. See, so what would advice would you get to someone, Rebecca? I know you you did 
talk about this a little bit in the presentation, but if they're just starting out, you know, they they don't have a keyword map quite yet. Um, or, you know, they haven't really thought about keywords, at least to the level that you're <laughs> describing. What's a good way for somebody to just get their feet wet that could have an impact on their site? So I would tell you, ooh, what on earth did I just do? Okay, I was going to go back to that process map that I had, <laughs> and PowerPoint just freaked out on me. Um, so go back to that the process map that I had um, and and really look at you know that flow right ask those questions the beginning and the next one was start making you know your seed list and look at your con your your existing rank like in Google Search Console you know for search analytics look at your competitors start with a seed list there get yourself thinking and that's going to be you know the best way to take to get going. It's great advice. Just baby steps. Just to baby build up. Steps. Yep. yep. Build the momentum up. So, <laughs> one of the things that people have to uh, do, obviously, when they're using Learn Dashes, and it's one of the bigger questions that we get is what theme should I use? I, I want my courses to look good, and I just, you know, I want to have, it's going to represent my company. I want it to um, be reflective of our course content and our business. Uh, there's a lot of questions about SEO in the context of themes. Are there anything that, is there anything that you, look for if like you're looking to search for a theme for example or you know maybe theme best best practices to be aware of because obviously we know there's the plugins the Yoast and all that yeah. some content but, but uh, the, the plugins can't help when the theme itself is just crappy and here's an example I got a comp or I got a client in and I said that I would help him with SEO we would take over his maintenance and then I realized he was on a theme for his theme and I went in there and the way the theme was architected it had all of this crappy default content and all these pieces and parts and the home page was made up of all these individual URLs which was duplicate content right and it was and none of it is built built to SEO best practices so I had to go in and clean up a bunch of that for us to be able to rank in anything else so you have that's, to pick a solid theme I mean that's you a great point. yeah you know like Genesis is really great for themes I'm sure Justin you've got a list of, of solid themes there has to be you know, uh, a good basis. Otherwise, it's going to derail your SEO efforts. Now, are there only certain themes that are SEO friendly? Not at all. There's a lot of good themes out there, ready and able to run Learn Dash. Um, and you know, you just got to make sure that it, it adheres to best practices. Yeah, and you made a good point in there too. That <laughs> I think um, you know, a lot of themes when you purchase it, you're like, oh, that looks so great, and they give you that dummy content to put in, which is good. But if a thousand people have done the same thing. Um, and don't get rid of it. This guy didn't get rid of it. It was all still sitting there. I it's, I spent probably five hours cleaning it up just to just to try to scale his website back to really what his content was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's a that's a great point. All the images that come in ported with all the same descriptions, you're pretty much yep. just going to get lost in the shuffle. So yep, um, and it's duplicate content, and it goes against you from an SEO standpoint. Get rid of all of it. All right, guys. Well, we have a few more minutes of Rebecca's time, so if you have any questions, please do um, submit it. Um, somebody asked, which theme is Rebecca using for the Learn Dash course? And so, Rebecca, I'll let you. Oh, yeah. If I can get over to it. Um, so, my my Learn Dash course. This is based on my Web Savvy theme, um, and it is actually on our Web Savvy site. We have a similar theme called James. <laughs> it's. Let me see if I can pull it up right now since my presentation is not working and I do apologize for that freaking out on me. So as Rebecca looks this up, so in addition to her agency and her <coughs> courses and her SEO boot camp, which by the way, I hope that she, she mentions at some point, um, but she has a theme store <laughs> on yeah. her site for the Genesis framework. So anyway, and, go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, this is that this James theme is a scaled down version of our of our web savvy theme. I can't remember if we still have Learn Dash styling in there. We might not. Um, but that's the theme that we're using. And basically I just kinda had it tweaked. Um, you know, I just and I made it our own. And it didn't take a whole lot of tweaks to kind of make it our own and you know, like just, you know, for us putting the times in that was something that I had my developer tweak because I thought that that was really beneficial for people to see how much time was going to be associated with you know each course um, and Justin thank you for pimping my SEO boot camp just in case anyone really wants to deep dive on this I do have an, a three-day workshop coming up in Oklahoma uh, and next month that I'd love to have you come join us if this is you know something that would be available to you yeah. um, anyways 
So hit, what's the next question, Justin? Sure. Um, <laughs> let's bring it back to SEO real quick um, because uh, there's some good questions here. So what about for uh, URLs that are in a foreign language, like if uh, their course is in Russian or, or something like that? So uh, you did mention, um, I think, something about the titles and don't use a bunch of characters, but, you know, there are languages, for example, they have accents and, and different characters in it. So is there any consideration? Uh, in, <coughs> I would think not, but maybe uh, for somebody that has a language in a foreign language, how that how they should approach SEO? Totally different, right? So when I say characters, I mean your web software and mostly non-WordPress software is pushing in funky characters and creating just weirdness in it. And I see it with really bad themes sometimes too. Those are the parameters that I'm talking about. If you have characters in Russia, or, you know, the Russian language that would appear in the, in the URL, that's not what, that was not what I was referring to. Google is smart enough to understand that you know, your characters are part of your language and they should be there. So don't worry about that. Okay, great. Georgia, hopefully that answers your question. Thanks for submitting that. <laughs> yeah, else. that was a good question. Um, anything else, guys? This is, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. I want to make sure that we, we can get some questions in. Um, does LearnDash have a way to show the course content like we saw on Rebecca's website? Um, Great question, Peggy. The answer is, <laughs> the answer is to some degree, yes. Um, the Learn Dash Visual Customizer added new templates. Um, you can get to this, by the way, by just you can go to the Add-ons page on Learn Dash. Uh, the Visual Customizer <laughs> is an add-on by Snap Orbital, and they added some new templates that do include some timing. So you could put like, you know, like Rebecca has her four minutes, fifteen minutes. It won't look exactly the same, uh, but there is uh, that component, or you know, you could have it, you have it customized, and maybe Rebecca will sell her template. I'm just kidding, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> I just did that because I wanted people to know what they were in for. You know, I don't want you to start, for example, the competitive research section if you know the topic if you don't have 60 minutes to allocate, and that's why I put it in there. And it, you know, it, it, not all courses probably need it, but I think because of ours is eight hours long, I thought that it was it was definitely a value. <laughs> Okay, got another SEO question here from, from Dan. Um, can you be successful without reputable or relevant sources linking to you? So, so can you link without, or excuse me, can you rank without inbound links? Yes. Google says you can as well. Um, is it as easy? No. And keep in mind that those links are all over the website, not just to, you know, to the homepage. But again, I don't chase links. What I do do is I'm here today. Right? I'm giving freely of myself and of my time and of my education so that I make myself available to the community. It's why I go speak at WordCamps. It's why I sponsor the local t-ball team. I get inbound links from all of that activity. I, you know, I, I am active on social. All of that activity helps that link building campaign. And so I have lots of incoming links without the actual process of trying to go to unknown webmasters and asking them for links. So, you know, just try to keep that in mind. The things that you would do with traditional marketing, do that, and, but also when you're doing that, make sure that you're getting those inbound links back. Yeah, that's great advice. I think there's a lot of times um, when you read about SEO, uh, and myself included, you just see so much <laughs> content just about, oh, inbound links and who's linking to you and it's links, 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 and it just seems like um, the focus can become on getting links rather than writing and creating content for the user, which you're a big advocate for. Yes, and, and that's, it's why I do webinars. It's why I give myself freely. I just think that, you know, it's, it's about karma. You know, internet marketing is about karma. If you give yourself and give yourself wholly and, it, and you honestly, genuinely want to help those around you, which I do, I believe people come back, you know, they, they give back. And that's what the whole link building thing is. And that's the whole point. That's why Google uses it, right? It wants to know that somebody cares about you and that appreciates what you're doing, and you can only truly get that is if if you're giving, and you know, like I said, give freely, and you will get those links coming back to you tenfold. Very sound advice, and you know, guys, with that, we are we're kind of over time here, and uh, we appreciate all of the questions, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the webinar is recorded, and you know, there'll be more information on that coming out. Uh, shortly, but again, thank you all so much. And Rebecca, uh, 
before we close out, um, if you could again share, you know, where people can get a hold of you or some of your, your web properties, that would be fantastic. Sure. You can reach me, all of me, through RebeccaGill.com, uh, which gives a lot of my presentations. It'll give links down here to all my social. Um, there is a link to YouTube, which has a lot of training videos that I've done. And then these guys right here link all over to my, um, my web properties and just kind of a central place. If you've enjoyed the webinar, I'd love to have feedback. Just uh, give me a shout out on Twitter and, you know, tell me what was of interest and that will help me know what to focus on in the future. And hopefully Justin will invite me back and I can do another webinar for you when I'm not so sick and not coughing the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, judging by the feedback, everybody uh, everybody has very kind words to say here. So I think that's a I think that's definitely a possibility in the future. So thank you so much, Rebecca, um, and My thank pleasure. you all thank you all for joining us. Um, until next time, keep an eye on your inbox. We'll be having more webinars uh, in the future. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great day or night or morning wherever you are in the world.